please watch out for that. My name is Andrew Levy. I am one of the co-founders of Amuzi. And uh, a few months ago, we had Amuzi camp with this crazy idea to just have awesome conversations about things that are really interesting to us uh, about the future. That awesome and disgusting uh, terminology, the new normal, where we've just put a what's in front of it and it changed the entire game. So we're very excited about that. Uh, and just created a series around things that are interesting to us, things that are on our minds, and things that are in our thoughts. Uh, to this week, I suppose, and this one specifically today, comes at, I suppose, quite a difficult time in the world. And while we're not speaking specifically about that uh, in this conversation, I think it would be remiss of us not to talk and not to observe what's going on in the world around us. Um, so in order for us to get this conversation underway, I'd like us to please just observe a minute of silence. And I know you're all on mute, so this is gonna sound and feel very weird, but a minute of silence for black lives around the world and the struggles that they continue to go through on a daily basis. I think we've seen treacherous things happen in America. We've seen horrible things happen during the lockdown in South Africa and obviously in our past. And I think it would just be a small symbol of standing together with uh, black people and people of color across the world. So I'm just gonna put a little clock on uh, for a minute of silence and then we'll get going with our normal program. And if you'd like to stand during this time, please feel free to do so as well. Okay, uh, for those of you, thank you so much everyone. And for those of you who have just joined us, uh, no, we didn't freeze. Uh, we were just uh, observing a minute of silence for I suppose the craziness that is our world at the moment. Um, today we're talking about online learning, uh, which, is, which is a really interesting and fascinating topic. We've got three incredible speakers uh, and I'm not gonna take up too much of, of, of their time, but uh, to introduce them very quickly, we've got Sarah Black, Rob Paddock and our very own Gilbert Pooley. And they're gonna be talking about their experiences of online learning, what it's meant to them over the, the last uh, couple of weeks, years that they've been involved in this, and um, what they see the future being, some of the challenges, and potentially also some of the opportunities. Uh, Sarah, if I could ask you to unmute, we're gonna start with you. I think uh, Sarah is a, a former high school maths teacher uh, who now trains teachers and works in critical education sociology. Uh, she has a focus on equity and justice in the education policy. Um, and she, she has many doctorals and postdoctorals, but right now she's a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Education Rights and Transformation at the University of Johannesburg, and is, and is also a research fellow at the Center for Innovation. If you thought that that's all she did, she is also a keen trail runner, seamstress, and musician. Um, Sarah, we're gonna start with you. And um, hello, are you there? I am. I'm trying to wonder how to respond after that introduction. Don't hello. worry. That's uh, there. You go. Um, it's all the books in the background. That's the, that's uh, that's that's what makes you so incredibly bright. <laughs> um, I've got to keep the nerd facade up. <laughs> uh, I think um, let's get started with you, and and I'll let you take the conversation forward uh, around an article that you wrote uh, in response to Stephen Curtis. Stephen Curtis, obviously a big political analyst in South Africa and broadcaster. He wrote an article about online learning and the opportunities within it. And um, you wrote quite a, a scathing attack on, on his analysis. Um, and I would, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts as to why, what, what are some of the challenges that maybe we're not seeing in online learning um, at the moment, specifically in the, the South African context, given 
given our situation at the moment. And I think just to say to anyone who is interested in um, asking Sarah any questions, please do ask questions during, uh, during uh, or in the chat. And uh, if there's anything there that we can answer, we'll answer once you're done. Okay, Sarah, I will leave it over to you. And uh, yeah, give us your thoughts on online learning, some of the opportunities and maybe some of the challenges as well. Sure, thank you, Andrew. And good afternoon to everybody. Thanks for making time. I think everybody's a bit webinared out at the moment, so it's wonderful to see such a lovely, strong attendance. I think for me, I would like to start with the idea that online learning is necessarily a new idea in terms of educational reform. Um, I'm very fond of George Bernard Shaw, who said, it's only called technology if it was invented in your lifetime. Um, you know, technology has shifted the way that we think about education at multiple points in the past. And while the internet is certainly one of the most um, seismic ruptures, if we can put it that way, it's not the first time that things like, for example, something as simple as the printing press, something as simple as the postal service, uh, ideas of um, open education versus and, and correspondence education. So I do want to locate the idea of learning online in that broader historical arc that education is constantly in a dialogue with technological development and what it can enable with education and also what is lost when you transmit to different types of modes of teaching and learning. So I'd like to start with that. Um, I just had an interesting conversation with a, a researcher at the University of Connecticut in the United States yesterday who was also interested in, in doing research on online learning, particularly in the pandemic moment. And she was blown away at the idea that, you know, 90% of South African households do not have access to internet beyond their phones. Um, that is one of the simple infrastructural issues that poses challenges to online learning, not replicating existing inequalities in a country like South Africa. So I'm going to start with the challenges, but then I also want to kind of talk to some of the potential. So the one obviously is infrastructure, and it's not just about do you have fiber or do you have connectivity to your home? It's more basic infrastructural issues like power and bandwidth. For example, when I went up to a school in the Eastern Cape near the Amatola Mountains, there was a beautiful safe room full of laptops donated to the school by a well-meaning company. They were all kept in the strong room in the principal's office and they were very fancy paperweights because the school had erratic electricity provision and with a client server type of architecture or mostly online type of architecture, which has what we've been seeing develop over the last 10 years in terms of software development. If you don't have enough bandwidth to upgrade your software or work on a remote server type of processing architecture, you're, very, you're gonna really, really struggle to um, engage with anything online meaningfully. There were students in that village who wanted to apply to Walter Sisulu University and they couldn't actually download Adobe Acrobat to fill the application form in to the university. So it kind of gives you a sense that there are multiple layers of material infrastructure that mean that accessing online learning meaningfully for a lot of South Africans is just not there. There are also cultural barriers. Uh, we have a massive problem, and this is interesting because it's not just an issue in online learning. We have a massive problem in terms of students in South Africa being able to access the languages of teaching and learning that we use in our formal institutions. Um, we know that English and Afrikaans are the modes of delivery from grade four onwards. They are the home languages of about 20% of the country. So for the other 80% of our children, those children are learning in their third or fourth, often fourth or fifth or sixth language. For rural students, those languages are often foreign languages in the sense that they don't encounter them in the, in the street. They don't encounter them in the shop. So in the city, the kids might learn English and Afrikaans because they're in more heterogeneous linguistic communities. But in the rural areas, we know that that's not the case. So there are cultural barriers as well to participating in online learning. But having said that, I mean, I could, I could talk more, but I want to give the other speakers a chance. There are emancipatory potentials to the technology. If we can notice the types of economic, political, and cultural systems that they are in and design them explicitly to rather resist and disrupt those, those flows of power, if we can put it that way. Um, 
unfortunately, in my experience, because I, I have worked in the software development industry, uh, most people who write code and are responsible for developing code don't have sociological imagination or a very refined political awareness and hence don't realize that the code they're writing or the software architectures they're developing actually replicate social inequalities instead of disrupting them. That doesn't have to be the case, but we need to be a lot more conscientious about how we design online learning and what kinds of um, power structures those systems operate in if we really want it to be an emancipatory technique. I'm gonna stop there. Awesome, thank you so much, Sarah, for, for opening up and uh, starting the conversations with us. Um, I think you, in your article, you, you spoke about um, the idea of it being uh, ahistorical, a-contextual, and excuse my pronunciation, unpedagogical, I think that's the way to say it. Unpedagogical. You can clearly see that I have absolutely no idea what that means, but I had to look it up. <laughs> but thank you so much uh, for, for bringing that context. I think it was really eye-opening for me personally to, to understand exactly what some of the challenges are. I have put her article in the in the chat, so if you want to check it out, please do there. Next uh, on on the on the group speak is is Rob Paddock. Uh, Rob, if you can unmute yourself. And um, for those that that don't know Rob, uh, he was the co-founder of Get Smarter, an online education company that's educated over a hundred thousand working professionals from one hundred and thirty four uh, countries. Um, it's got a numerous amount of uh, awards. He is also the founding member of Ingeni, um, but his latest venture, which is really, really super interesting, is he's the founder now and CEO of a place called the Valencia Institute, which is a global private online high school. Rob, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I think given what Sarah's outlined, you're looking into a very different part of the market uh, and potentially a different space. What's, you know, you've been in online education for a long part of your life. What are some of the, the, the other side of the coin? What are some of the opportunities that, that potentially online learning allows us? Mm, thank, thank you, Andrew. And, and just wonderful to be speaking straight after Sarah, because I think that Sarah's laid some incredibly important groundwork and really identified some of the challenges that exist in a place like South Africa. And, and to, I guess to, to summarize from my side, two, two key areas. One is that the, the infrastructure is such a key consideration when we're thinking about an appropriate online educational intervention. In fact, when we're thinking about any sort of educational intervention, the context in which they, these, we find these, these individual learners and the appropriate infrastructure that they have or they don't have. That includes things like, I mean, like languages. It's so contextually specific. And I think I get quite frustrated when I hear things like, oh, you know, what we'll do is we'll put a tablet in every student's hands and they'll give them access to the internet and that's going to suddenly solve, solve the world's educational challenges. It's just like wrong, wrong, wrong. Like low resolution thinking, we need to seriously sharpen up our approach when, we, when we're thinking about solving very complex problems. And let's be clear, education is a complex challenge and it needs complex and nuanced solutions which are quite very contextually specific. So Andrew, to your point, I, I guess I, I operate in two kind, of, two kind of spheres. The one sphere is this global private online high school. That is a high fee paying, that is students paying four to 6,000 US dollars uh, per year. This is not solving South Africa's education crisis. So just, just to be clear on that. The opportunity there is that we've been able to attract private sector capital, private sector capabilities, and we're delivering from South Africa to a global audience and global student base. Um, paying in US dollars, pounds, etc. One of the things that I've challenged myself to do since, since starting Get Smart and now starting the Valencia Institute is to try and think about how for-profit and not-for-profit could, could intersect in a really meaningful way. So what, we, what we're doing at the Valencia Institute is that we are predominantly and increasingly servicing students who are abroad and they are experiencing a high-touch, socially rich, fully online learning experience, which is a Brit British standard curriculum. Um, and the, the early results have been incredibly encouraging. Um, and the uptake has been, has been really profound, particularly since the, the onset of COVID. Um, but really, I think the, the, the bigger opportunity for us that we see is to take a lot of the surplus that is created in a for-profit mechanism such as, as Valencia Institute and channel that into servicing students who, who, who just simply couldn't afford to pay like four to six thousand um, dollars. So we've, st we've started something called the Abode Trust which is our first project we started in January of this year, which is in Mitchell's Plain. And that is effectively a blended learning solution. And again, to Sarah's point, 
we're not just handing out laptops in Mitchell's Plain and saying, hey, jump on the Valencia Institute um, model and it's all going to work out well for you. It, it just simply wouldn't work. So what we've done there is we've taken a previously unutilized classroom, which was in, uh, which is at a, at a particular very low quintile school, um, radically underperforming on, on all the appropriate measures. We did diagnostic assessments with, a, with, a, with over 70 students. And from that, we took a, a, a strong array of students at different academic levels, and we've brought them into this blended learning classroom. Now, just to give you a sense of what that blended learning classroom is like, all of the academic experience that, that is taking place is delivered online. And what that looks like is that students are engaging in certain asynchronous learning activities. Those would be uh, high quality pre-recorded video lectures, notes, graphics, animations, e-learning simulations, and more. And they will then move very quickly into live classrooms. So in a Zoom-like environment, but built specifically for education, students are then having their learning facilitated by, the, by some of the country's best teachers. And for me, this is one of the key aspects of, of, and opportunities that online represents, particularly in these marginalized and rural communities. The opportunity to link high quality teaching, teaching and learning to these students is just not realistic in the brick and mortar model. Unfortunately, what ends up happening is that the lowest performing teachers end up stay, staying and working in these most challenged areas. And quite frankly, that those are the students who need the best quality teaching and learning. So th this for us is a really interesting bridge that's being built, but then, to have their studies entirely online would be missing a certain, a certain trick. And one of the things that we've, that we've done is that the role of what we call a mentor, um, who is not a subject matter expert, they're not expected to teach in, in any particular subject, their role is to provide that critical pastoral care, that absolutely essential emotional connection with students. That This was beautifully said to me the other day that we radically underestimate the degree to which learning is an emotional process, and we overestimate the degree to which it is a cognitive and intellectual process. And I just thought that that was so brilliantly put because there isn't a single learner out there who is taking intellectual leaps, intellectual risks when they're coming off a, off a low emotional base. And so for us, we see one of, the, one, of the major, one of the major opportunities is to have a dedicated function that is focusing solely on that pastoral care. And that person is from that community. They can culturally identify with those, with those learners and help create an effective bridge into this online world where students are now getting access to these, to these high quality teachers who are located throughout the country. So we're, we're it's, it's early days. We are very excited at the early, at the early results that we're, we're achieving with this project. Um, but I think really what, one of the, the critical questions that we have to answer as a country is how do we start to scale high quality, high quality educational provisions and make it contextually appropriate and specific? And these are not, these are not necessarily easy, easy questions to answer, but we've got to start somewhere. So for us at the Valencia Institute, we're focusing in on Mitchell's Plain to start with in the Western Cape. Um, and we're looking to, to stand up a series of what we would call micro schools, these boutique schools that are focused on students who otherwise could never have access to this sort of quality of teaching and learning um, and really trying to shift, shift the needle that way. Awesome. Rob, thank you so much for giving us a little bit of insight. I'm sure I see Sarah's writing down furiously there, so I'm sure there'll be some good questions between the speakers as well. Um, I think last, last speaker on the panel is uh, Gilbert Pooley, um, my co-MD co at Umuzi. Gil, um, thank you so much. If you can unmute and uh, welcome to you. I think, you know, Sarah indicated some of the challenges that we've definitely seen in our day-to-day -day, uh, work and, and Rob has seen some of the opportunities that we potentially see. Of course, we, through COVID-19, had to close down our studios uh, in Johannesburg with over 200 young people in them um, and move very quickly to uh, a remote kind of uh, learning um, curriculum and response. Take us through exactly how that, how that happened, what happened, and some of the learnings potentially that you've seen along this journey. Thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, I think a lot of resonance with what Sarah and, and Rob have shared um, in terms of, of not underestimating the, the complexity um, of, of the, this, this challenge of creating online learning, um, effective online learning. I think, you know, Umuzi is sort of like many organizations was put into a, a, a tough corner um, with, with the COVID-19 um, and, you know, our first problem was dealing with, with how to help our 200 learners to continue learning. So we issued everyone with a, a computer and internet connection um, and data. And, and, and so, so we put in that minimum infrastructure to make sure that everyone could take, could take, uh, take that home and, and, and have access. 
The challenge, though, is, is that, you know, obviously many home environments aren't entirely conducive and supportive. But I'd say that even though we deal with a, a low income um, community, uh, by and large, like, our, I think that what, what, was, what was interesting is that about at least 75% of, of our, our learners managed to find sort of a successful uh, productivity that, that was comparable to, to what they were able to achieve whilst we were in, in person and studio. And I was quite surprised, you know, with, with that level of, 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 of productivity and learning that was happening um, because, you know, we transitioned so quickly to this online learning model. And I think unpacking it has, has, has really been interesting because we, we discovered that we were actually much better prepared for online learning than, than we initially thought. So we'd made quite a lot of investments in, in, in shifting to online curriculum. So we were definitely operating in a very blended learning um, mode or modality, even, even though um, up until that point, we'd relied on coming to the office every day and, and working with each other. So instead of focusing on creating a lot of our own content, we'd, we'd been for some time curating the best online learning. And, and we focus on tech education, so it's teaching people how to code, um, teaching people to, to be data scientists, um, data engineers, UI, UX professionals. Um, but there's so much good learning material out there that, that you know, our facilitators invest some of their time not in building a new curriculum, but by curating the best online learning material and finding good platforms. So we use things like Code Academy, uh, Code Camp, um, uh, Free Code Camp, Data Camp, um, even things like Khan Academy for, for some of the, the, the basics in terms of getting people's maths and, and stats levels up. Um, and, and there's a whole wide range of tools that we started to adopt, not just in the education space, but also common tools that are used by software developers. Um, and, and, you know, these, these are things like Git and GitHub where, that facilitate collaboration so that people can work on, on the same project um, and, and, and it manages virgin control issues and, 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 and collaboration, which is sort of an industry standard tool. Um, also, also using um, concepts and processes like Agile, we, we implemented a lot of that. So, so even in the learning process, young people learning how to, to follow Agile principles. So they'd have their daily stand-up, they'd have a clear black backlog of things that they needed to learn or work on. And our learning is very, very practical at Amuzi, so it's, it's about practicing coding. They'd have their backlog, they'd prioritize a few items that they'd be working on. Um, in terms of their, their doing, and then they'd be shifting those into done and, 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 and sort of following agile principles and minimizing the amount of, 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 of sort of work in progress and tracking through, you know, working through sprints and moving, moving things through, becoming more aware of how long it takes them to, to work through things. So a number of these different mechanisms that we'd, we'd sort of inculcated already in our way of working help tremendously in terms of our shift to, to online learning. And, and I think that there's a real lesson in there for me, and, and I'd love, love to sort of flip it back to, uh, to Sarah and, and Rob and, and hear their reflections on this, because I, I, I think it's a secret of, of getting this online learning right, is that many people have this image where they focus on the content, um, and Rob talked even about the technology, so it's the tablet, it's the hardware that's given out, and people think it's, the, it's, it's you know, the most important thing is the content, the video that someone's watching or the, the little test that they're doing, whatever's, whatever content is on the, on, 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 on the tablet. But what we've found is, is it's actually about solving the problem of, of engaging the learner and managing the learner. And Sarah, you talk really nicely about this in your article, your Daily Maverick article that Andrew shared the link to. Um, and you talk about the role of the teacher, you know, being, being very dynamic and, and creating these learning moments and responding to the learner. And obviously, when you don't have the classroom interaction, you don't have that. So you've got to somehow create that dynamism of learning um, or help the learner to create that themselves. Um, so I think that a big focus for us has been on workflow management and helping the learners to stay motivated. And it's really it's really compensating for that sort of project manager role that the teacher plays, which is helping learners to, to not, not just, de, the teacher's not just delivering the content, um, but it's, it's helping learners with the process of grappling with the content and understanding it. And um, so, so that's really been where our focus is. And we've, we've invested in our, our online learning platform um, and, and redoubled our efforts, obviously now, now, now that we've shifted to the remote learning entirely. And I think, you know, Simple thing, coming back to the Agile, what we found works really effectively and we've built it into the user interface of our learning platform is 
giving the learners a, a sense of what their backlog is, of things that they can learn, giving them some agency to choose what they want to learn, and they bring that into doing. Once they've done that, then they can push it into a review stage, and they see that it's waiting for review from, from their facilitator or teacher. Once it's reviewed, if they've got work to do, it gets pushed back to them, they make some corrections, and then it goes into the done column. So it's, it's teaching them how to break things into, you know, break tasks down, work on things, move them through, see it as a pipeline, manage their productivity. So you know, I'm giving very specific examples here which are relevant to coding, but I think that they have broader application and I'd be very interested to hear you know, Sarah and, and Rob's reflections on that. Um, but before, before we go back to them, I think just one last thing to, to say that you know, playing open cards, it's you know, like many organizations, Amuzi has struggled with, with, with COVID-19 and the pandemic and our, you know, our traditional sources of revenue have, have dried up completely. Um, you know, usually we're funded by employer partners, um, you know, big South African companies like, like Investec um, and, and TIH and, and um, Standard Bank is a, a big partner, NASPERS. We, but their skills development budgets under a lot of pressure and they're sort of taking a wait and see uh, approach at the moment. So they haven't been willing to trigger new training, which has been challenging for us. We're not generating revenue. Um, and so it's forced us to think about how can we more efficiently deliver our existing learning because we've, we've got to reduce our costs. Um, and, and it's also given us thought to think, you know, because we've transitioned so well to online learning, are there new markets that we can play in? And that's quite exciting for us because we've realized that with, with these tools that we've developed and the effectiveness of our online learning, we can look at a much bigger market, a more addressable market. So we've been focused on South Africa up until now. But we've realized with these tools, now we can potentially serve a much larger market, an African market, a global market. So an idea that we're, we're playing with at the moment is to, to try and engage with coding schools, coding boot camps across the continent and, and, and lend them some of our tools and capabilities. Because we've, we've really built a lot of these, the, these tools all the way from our recruitment process to find the right people through this whole education journey. I've been t telling you about how we're supporting that online learning in terms of finding the right curriculum these sort of process management things that we'll be doing. And then importantly, linking the young people who finish our program into job opportunities and making sure that they get placed and economically active. So how can we lend this capacity to boot camps across the, the continent and enable them to be more effective so that they themselves can scale and they can get more people through their programs and improve the chances of those young people actually being work ready and getting jobs? Because it's one of, one of the things we're most proud of at, at Amuzi is that over 80% of the young people who start our program, even though they're unemployed, and many of them, the majority of them have, have got very little tertiary education, um, they, there's an 80% conversion rate of them, them getting into high value jobs as software developers, data scientists, et cetera, at the end of the program. So, so we think we've got a recipe that works. And I think a lot of it is underpinned by leveraging this online um, learning, but, but in the ways that I'm saying, not, 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 not in the simplistic ways. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think, Andrew, it might be nice to go back to the other speakers, and I'd really love their reflections on, on how important they think some of this workflow and process management is and, and how you can compensate for the lack of a, a live teacher in the classroom. Um, it would be fascinating to, to hear from them about their, their different experiences. Thanks, Gil. Um, Rob, Sarah, any reflections or thoughts or questions uh, to any of the other panelists and maybe to answer Gil's question as well? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to jump in. Um, I think that the, the question of oh, workflows, organizational structure, capabilities amongst the team, it's a huge point of reflection for me and one, one that I think is important to share. It is, let, let's maybe take a step back and think about the role of a teacher in a traditional classroom. You are a subject matter expert, you're a curriculum designer, you're a lesson facilitator, you are a marker, you are an administrator, you are a social worker, you are a confidant, you are a mentor, you're a sports coach, you are so many jobs that need to be formed, need to be performed simultaneously. And I think that one of the reflections I have is that it is, it is the rare individual that is capable of doing all of those functions simultaneously well, and then managing and then managing to also put up with things like low pay and difficult working conditions and so on that and 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 that kind of coming together of capabilities and willingness to, to drive change is such a is such a rarity that by my estimation it's no wonder that we don't have enough good teachers like i really do feel that this in many ways it's an unreasonable job description certainly any of us if we had to think about this in the kind of commercial space, we'd say absolutely not. And like no one person is going to do all of those jobs. Let's do the hard work of breaking it down into its component parts 
Let's make sure that we put professionals in each one of those spheres. And then let's start to think differently about how we use technology. Let's use technology rather to coordinate the activity of these individuals so we can still have a single view of the students. And for me, I think this is one of the biggest affordances and opportunities that technology presents. I am absolutely certain that technology is a completely in, in, inappropriate and, and uh, inconsequential replacement for humans in the learning process. Like humans, again, coming back to this point of the learning being predominantly an emotional process on top of which cognitive abilities are built, like that human to human connection, that emotional ability is a very human thing. But, but that said, there are a plethora of inefficiencies that sit around the edges of that human to human connection that technology can very reasonably streamline. And then if we maybe take another step back, and we start to think about the different components of the educational process being delivered by different experts in their respective fields. How we can start to think about an educational model that could actually scale more reliably, that could be purpose built for an online or a blended learning environment. But what I would say to you is that just taking the brick and mortar approach to teaching and learning and hoping that somehow that's going to translate online. Uh, my, my strong sense is that uh, particularly online education, it amplifies the pedagogical lacking and, in, and ineffectiveness of a lot of our classroom-based teaching. So, I mean, as, as a simple example, if our focus is on a teacher standing in front of a group and providing a whole bunch of didactic instruction, well, you know, we, we've seen that there's an element to which that, 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 is, that is important, but there's a strong degree to which actually you need rich data points that you're getting, that you're picking up from your students and seeing, okay, I see Johnny in the corner is, 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 is kind of slumping off. I've had that corridor conversation with Jane last week, and I know that I need to check in with her. Like these rich data points that we often assimilate in the in-person environment, they're just completely gone in the online environment. If you haven't purpose built an online environment that gives you rich learning analytics that's made, made available in dashboard settings that's linked to work in progress, this is, this is a purpose built learning environment that again, it's no wonder that so many institutions have struggled right now during COVID to make the leap from in-person and brick and mortar education to online because honestly guys, it's not like, it, it shares similarities, but it's not the same. Like it needs, to be, it needs to be designed for the context in which these learners are going to be experiencing it. Um, so yeah, sorry, that, that's a long, long monologue in, in response. I'm sure Sarah has more sensible things oh, to say. That, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Sarah, um, you had your hand up. If anyone else wants to ask a question or add any, any thoughts or reflections to this, con to this topic, please put your hand up and, and we, will, we will come to you next. Sarah, thoughts, reflections, questions? Thank you. Um, there's, there's a lot of rich threads to pick up with what both Gilbert and Rob have shared with us. Um, and I'll try and kind of be quite sort of clear with them, but they do all interact. Um, I think just to pick up on the last point Rob was making about the idea that the, what, what we ask the vast majority of our teachers in this country to do requires saints and martyrs. And we will not find 400,000 saints and martyrs to staff a public schooling system. But rather than kind of saying, well, we must then abandon the idea of a public system, which I'll come back to, one of the things that I'm busy doing at the moment, and um, I'm trying to kind of foreground to people who are not aware of the conditions, what I call our exposed schools, I feel uncomfortable with the word dysfunctional because I think that that eclipses a lot of the hard work that does happen in those schools, but I call them exposed because um, as I was sharing my research with my PhD and in my book called that the chalk face, it's, you won't believe it. If you haven't been there and you haven't seen it, you won't believe it. I was the head of a mathematics department in a Quintal II township school. We were racked with gang violence. Not a week went by when we didn't have a child in the hospital for something. We had, we were so understaffed, we had one free teacher at any one time. So that means that if, if any of our teachers' lives were just normal human lives, your child is sick, your car breaks down, um, you need to go to home affairs, all of a sudden you have a school where you have an unattended class. And it's not just 30 children, it's 60 children. I once had a district manager visit me because I was standing in as a deputy principal at the time, unattended, uh, unannounced, walks into my classroom, says, I need to meet with you now. And this is not, this is not an unusual occurrence in, in um, exposed schools. It's not something that the district officials do to the functional schools because they actually give them the space to breathe and do what they need to do. But they have this desire to press on what they think are dysfunctional schools and make us do our jobs. 
and he walked into my classroom, extracted me from my grade nine maths class with no warning, sat down in a meeting, he just interrupted my whole lesson, by the way, and then had the audacity to moan that the school was noisy because now, thanks to him, an unattended class of kids was running around with no adult to see them. The toilets are broken. There's no water. Every weekend we would come back and we'd say, okay, someone else has peeled back the roof and stolen whatever. Um, I had a river running under my classroom. And if my kids wanted to line up outside of my classroom, they had to stand in a puddle. Most of the time I would out of my own money go and buy socks, blankets, tell my kids to leave their wet shoes at the door. And I'm not saying this to try and sort of say, well, look at me, I'm a great teacher. Rather, I want to say that the kinds of things I'm talking about are what I know my colleagues in the townships and in the rural schools do for their kids every day. Like Rob said, the roles that the teachers play are, are myriad. And under the kinds of material conditions we're asking them to work in, which is why the unions have refused to go back to schools now, and I actually support them, it, th those, those conditions beg a belief. Um, there's a lot of research from the Center for International Teacher Education and uh, some of the work I've done at UCT that shows that the schools, those teachers in those exposed schools are constantly having to interrupt, they have to choose between teaching and learning and the pastoral care that Rob was talking about. Because I don't blame a child who's afraid of going home to a drunk, um, abusive household that they're not really worried about quadratic equations. I really can't fault their prioritization there, I can't. Um, just to relate another short sense about what Rob was saying, uh, a student came into school was clearly kind of the victim of some kind of physical violence. And the police came to us as teachers and said, we don't know what to do. You guys need to help us. And we're going, but you're the law and order. We're the teachers. So there's this, that these are some of the textures about the idea of well, the whole, all these social systems that are not supporting children, that are coalescing and focusing in schools in in ways that are unbearable. Children are eating at schools. Children are sent to schools to be safe. Um, and schools are actually being used as a shield in many ways for a lot of other social systems that are not working to support the poor and the vulnerable. So I do think we need to think about those teachers and think about what they're facing um, in, in subtle and nuanced ways, which is not to say there aren't people who do things they shouldn't, but like Rob said, uh, none of us would put up with the conditions that people there are, are being asked to face. How does this relate to online learning? It comes back to what Gilbert was saying about the process of engagement, the dynamic, what we call a dialectic to and fro between the pedagogue and the student, the nature of the relationship that holds that engagement. And what I heard Gilbert describing was simply a healthy pedagogical relationship now just finding a technological mode. All right, so to, where, where does the technology come in? The technology is already being built on top of healthy pedagogical practice. Um, and what I think is interesting for me, where I think I differ from both Gilbert and, and Rob, but perhaps not as much as we might think, is that when contemplating Rob's question about the relationship between nonprofit and for-profit, we, we have to then ask ourselves serious questions about the role of the state. We have to ask those questions because at the end of the day, the state is a compact between all of us who is given the mandate to distribute and redistribute social goods to the benefit of us all. I personally am a strong believer in public education. There's a lot of good evidence to say that free public education is probably one of the best things countries can spend their money on. Um, and so there's an interesting shift between thinking about successful individual interventions and then trying to think about what that means for a scaled system-wide type of imagination. What do we think education is? What do we expect it to do for us as a community, as a group. And I'd argue we need to think that it needs to do more for us than just empower each of us as individuals to access economic opportunities. I think education needs to do more than that. It needs to do that, but if that's all it's doing for us, 
we're going to lose imagination about what it means to live together. We're going to lose imagination about the world beyond work. And I think that that would be a, a quite a, a, a poor version of what I think education should do for all of us and our children. And so I wouldn't use the word market when thinking about getting education out. I like to think in more democratic terms about what, do, what does a good, healthy public education system look like? There's a lot of pressure happening now to go, the basics, the, the raw basics are not in our schools. And COVID has made this really interesting awakening in the world where people have noticed what underinvestment in public, public facilities has done. I mean, public hospitals is a great example. Across the world, people are going, oh, wow. You mean we've gutted our public hospitals and now they can't cope with the pandemic? We have gutted our public schools in huge ways. And then we're surprised when they're not affecting meaningful teaching and learning. So for me, one of the interesting things to say is let's step back from just thinking about online, go back to what Rob was saying about technology being an enhancement of already effective pedagogical processes and go, okay, if we want online to work, we need to make sure there are effective pedagogical processes happening first. And for that, we need to make sure that the basic material conditions of teaching and learning are accessible to all our children and not just those whose parents can supplement the school with fees. Mm. Thank you, Sarah, um, for your, your insight there. I think there's uh, uh, one of the cool things about a, a round table like this is obviously our audience members. Simon Quete has been uh, putting his hand up for a little while. He's the co-founder of uh, STEM Dynamics and part of the African Leadership Initiative. Simon, do you want to just uh, unmute your mic and uh, ask your question or give a thought or comment or two? Yeah, sure. Uh, Andrew, thanks very much um, for that. I think for me, uh, one of the most exciting things about just uh, participating in this uh, webinar is having to draw on uh, the different experiences uh, collectively which are being shared here. Now, one of the things that I wanted to highlight is um, we run a number of STEM centers where we're focusing on uh, training uh, children between the age of seven all the way up to 18 uh, in 21st century learning. And ever since we've undergone into this lockdown period, some of the challenges we had seen is basically we ran a survey which we sent out to a number of students we were working with. And it asked the student to just give us feedback as far as what is it that they enjoy the most about working from home uh, or having to undertake uh, some of the lessons remotely uh, and, and what do they really hate. Um, funny enough, one of the things that was coming back was more in the area of the social aspects. Um, of students not being able to socially interact. And as much as I'm a firm believer in technology and the speakers we have had on earlier talked about it and had really amazing things to, uh, to share with us, my question is, as much as we're driving the need for technology and remote learning, how accessible or what's thought maybe open to everybody here could we ensure that socially we have the learners equally participating because to be in front of a computer for for a number of hours for the first couple of weeks i mean it's great but as it becomes a norm um one tend to lose some level of interest um, and I don't know if anybody uh, on this webinar have had similar experiences or have thought about it uh, in any way, because that's one of the challenges we seem to be having. Uh, and I'm just afraid if we don't come up with a way of exciting learners um, by conducting virtual or remote lessons, we could potentially equally be doing more harm than we're thinking we're doing the uh, justices. Awesome. Simon, thank you so much for your, your input. I've also put a link to STEM Dynamics on the chat. So if you want to check out what Simon does, have a look at it there. Uh, any one of the, the, the panelists want to have a go at this? Gil, I know we obviously at Amuzi do quite a bit of work around trying to build up the, the connection part of our organization. Rob, I know you've done in Get Smarter, you did a hell of a lot of work in making people productive and keeping them productive throughout the journey. Um, do you guys want to have a, a chat about this? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear from Rob on this because 
Um, when when we visited Get Smarter, um, you know, a couple of times, and 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 Rob, I remember um, seeing you on the stage at a Design and Darba talking talking about um, you know some of your your lessons at Get Smarter. Something that struck me then and, and has always really impressed me about the the model is that. You, you had an insight that it wasn't just around content. I mean, Get Smarter famously leverages really strong brands, um, so Ivy League brands, Oxford, um, UCT, et cetera, in terms of, of, of positioning like educators, lectures, and, and, and courses from those institutions. But I think some of the magic that people miss is not just with that, that sort of flashy brand and, and relevant coursework, but it's actually like the human system that you build. So you've got a, you've got a, a call center, an outbound call center, um, and you follow, uh, well, Get Smarter follows up rigorously with people. So once they've registered, it makes sure that they continue to learn and meet their deadlines. And if they fall behind, then and there's, there's sort of a human that follows up with you. And I, I remember that that was such a key in terms of managing to achieve a much, much higher completion rate than is typical in online learning. So this is one of the, the, the sort of uh, big failures of online learning is that there's such a low proportion of people that actually complete courses and, and convert them. It's, it's, it's in the low single digits. Um, whereas Get Smarter had, had managed to, to really achieve a much, much higher completion rate. I can't remember at the time, it was, it was sort of in the 80s, 80% 80 or, or, or more. Or so so I, uh, yeah, I'd love to hear how you're taking that sort of insight and experience into Valencia um, and creating this engaging, ongoing um, learning environment particularly because you're shooting for a high price point. You explained the dual model, but, but just, just focusing on the high price point, these are some learners that obviously have very high expectations. They've got lots of great alternatives in terms of entertainment, et cetera. So, so yeah, I, I think, um, you know, to, to that question on STEM dynamics, um, how do you keep people engaged? What lessons have you, could you share with us from, from your experience? Yeah, sure, and thanks Gilbert, and thank you Simon for the great question. Um, I think a lot of this comes down to what we would call learning design and purposefully designing for social engagement with, with social engagement in mind. If you think that social engagement is just going to happen by itself and, and you can just put up a platform and somehow students will magically navigate there and that they'll start to coordinate amongst themselves, I'm afraid that just, that just the vast majority of the time doesn't happen. So it's got to be purpose designed from the outset with that particular, let's call it uh, engagement, measure in mind or whatever. I think this is a, a principle that Sarah mentioned, but like the, the, the pedagogical principles that you want to infuse, that you have to design for those in, with, with those in mind. So as it relates to social engagement, I think about it in the, in the following ways. The one is that you don't put a thousand, you don't even put a hundred students in a classroom and expect there to be generative discourse that takes place. It just doesn't happen. Like it's too chaotic, it's too all over the place. We need to think about basic social and human dynamics, which is that we're in, when we're in smaller groups, we can start to develop more, more of a sense of rapport and there is trust that starts to develop over time. And over time, then we can start to really, really, um, we can, start to, we can start to see social engagement and, and collaboration, et cetera, really shoot through the roof. But there's a kind of foundation base building that needs to take place. So as an example, you want to start off by putting students into smaller tutorial groups. And this is, there's many ways you could do it. One of the approaches we've taken is put them into small tutorial groups from the outset. These are not arbitrary tutorial groups. These are tutorial groups in which they are doing a lot of their collaborative project work. So you also need to give students a meaningful reason to engage. Again, don't just put them in small space and hope that, that magically engagement is going to happen. Give them a reason to engage with each other. Give them a challenge-based learning scenario that they need to collaborate on together and then, and then help them to schedule the time to make sure that that collaboration takes place. And then let there be some sort of submission as part of that. That's just one example, and there are many, many examples like that. Um, I think another principle that's really important is that, is that trust gets built over time. And the more opportunities you can give students to intersect and to interact with each other, the more that trust can build, the more the depth of relationships can be forged. And that's a very, very powerful principle. Um, I, guess the, I guess the last principle is that there are many, many students who, if you just leave them to their own devices, they will, they will generally trend towards the, 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 the external. You want to make sure that one of the one of the key mechanisms that you're using, and Gilbert, you mentioned this um, that we did at Get Smart, and we we've taken this approach at Valencia. One of the great affordances of online education is that you can track and monitor the individual progress of every learner, and it gives you an opportunity in a pro, in a productive and let's call it remedial fashion to make sure that you get ahead of potential at-risk behaviour. So if you can see that a student hasn't been engaging for the last two days, in our case, a mentor will reach out and say. 
Hey Gilbert, I see that you haven't been that you haven't been online for the last two days. I just want to remind you that I'm here for you. Is there anything that's happened? How can I be be supported? But also I need to remind you that you've got this assignment that's coming up. And that human nudge is so much more effective than just like an automated email that comes. Like we we as humans, we are far more responsive to a human who has taken interest in us than just some sort of like nameless, faceless technological um, uh, communication or, or, or interaction. Um, so I think that there's there's a lot of, I, I guess the, the biggest the key, the key point here is purpose built with that particular with that particular desire in mind, i.e. social engagement. Um, the last thing I would say, Simon, just to your point, I do believe that social engagement is very possible. As an example, at Valencia Institute, uh, students are put into these small tutorial groups, and that's the way that all of their, their formal academics takes place. But we've also got things like virtual clubs that students are able to take part in. We do meetups for students who are physically located or geographically located in similar areas. And there's ways and means of starting to think quite creatively about how to, so how to get kids to socialize. But I, I do not think that online learning is for everyone. So again, to be clear, this is not this is not a solution that's going to work for every every single learner around the country. Um, I think that there's there's a proportion of students for whom the traditional brick and mortar environment is actually not particularly conducive, and so they're gravitating towards this online this online uh, modality with great enthusiasm. But again, there are plenty of students for whom this is not. And I think that when we think about the education landscape, it's tempting to think there's one solution and we can just roll it out across the whole con the whole country and it will work. And it's not that simple. I think we need I think we need multiple, um, let's call it multiple versions uh, and, and value propositions from, from different, different types of schools. Cool. Rob, thank you. Um, there's a question from Nomana Mavata. Uh, Nomana, if you want to unmute. And then I'd be curious to see if anyone who is on this call at the moment is actually an online learner themselves, and maybe they can give some of their experiences. Um, just uh, before we end off, we've only got about eight more minutes. Uh, to the speakers and the panelists, uh, I would just urge uh, if, while the Norman is asking a question, if you have any um, literature that you'd like to share in this uh, in this journey or on this journey around online learning and education specifically, please uh, think about it and we'll come back to you at the end just to talk it through and, and we'll, we'll hand those notes over to everyone uh, post, post the session as well. Norman, over to you. All right, thank you so much. Um, my network has been giving me ups and downs, but I have a question for Sarah. Um, it's a question that has been with me um, because I was, when I was in high school, I was in the private school system and then I went to the public school system. And when I went over to the public school system, I saw a lot of issues that she raised, how our maths or physics teacher wouldn't be in the classroom because of some, altercation or whether she had to join a meeting with would clash with our syllabus and we wouldn't be able to complete our syllabus but have to write the end of the year exams and everything. Like in South Africa, was it plausible to integrate uh, a level of online um, education, the education system with the public school system to make it more, I mean, effective because I spent most of my time in 2016 in matric, not learning maths and physics because of governmental, um, I guess, like implementations, I guess, where our teachers wouldn't be in the classroom or we wouldn't have water in the bathrooms or we wouldn't have water at all in the school facilities and it wouldn't be something that would be addressed. And it wasn't just me, but other public schools would have the same issues. So can... Um, the South African public school educational system integrate online learning to make learning actually possible. So when we actually leave high school, we actually learn something. Mana, great question. Thank you so much for asking it, Sarah. Um, I think the question was directed at you. Yes, thank you so much. Um, great question. And the, the short answer is that Ironically, the things we would need to implement to make online learning possible in the vast majority of our schools or in the homes of children who attend those schools would solve the problems of your teacher being out of classroom anyway. So it's about, again, the kind of material conditions of schools. Um, it's the same budget shortages that mean you don't have enough teachers and enough, you know, enough money to fix the taps that um, mean that you don't have people able to afford devices 
or uh, enough electricity and data. So what I think your, your question really, I, I mean, when I, when, I hear, when I hear other experiences of students like that, I, I confess I get, I get a little bit teary because the injustice that we do to 90% of our children um, is difficult to overstate. We, 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 talk, we look at the matric results, for example, and every, people, like to, people like to turn to technology as a solution for social problems. And I think that Robert and Gilbert would probably back me up on this, that actually technology very rarely solves social problems. Like I said in my article, people solve social problems. Um, and technology just enhances what people do. So if there's already enormous disparities in the system, and let me give you an illustration of this. If the government sends 16,000 rand a child to a school, the schools that can get parents to top up with fees, and that's less than 4% of them. We like, to, we like to think about them a lot in the media because often those of us writing in the media send our children to those kinds of schools. But a, the parents will literally triple that budget. And what will the school do with that budget? They will double the number of teachers the school hires. So I'm now thinking about high schools here in Cape Town and also ones I know in Joburg. For a thousand children, the government will send 26 teachers. Okay, the rough, the rough ratio is one to 40. But if you know how timetabling works and you know that teachers can't teach every lesson every day and it can't be rearranged like that, it ends up being one to 50, if not more. And then you go into, uh, I'm not going to name schools, but ones that charge 30, 40,000 rand a year, which is not unheard of in the X Model C schools at all. That school will have, I'm not joking, 62 teachers. And so it's not surprising that that teacher can stay in class because there's someone else to go and sort out the chafupal or the altercation or meet with the visiting, um, the, the visiting bureaucrat from the department. So I'm, I'm reluctant to sort of think about online learning as a solution for fundamentally underfunding our schools. We need together as South Africans to recognize that the situation is not sustainable. We cannot replicate this inequality for another generation. Our social fabric will collapse. And we need together to push the people who have the reins of power to do their jobs properly. And that means to provide public adequate education for everybody, not just for those whose parents can triple the school budget. Online learning will then become, as Rob said, another mode of flexibilizing what context requires. Like he said, I know children who would do very well with online learning. I know children for whom it would be a disaster. The point is it should be an option and not a fail safe because it will not plug the gaps in schools that are just without the bare basics. So I hope that that answers your question. Thank you, Sarah, Thank I really you. appreciate that. We are running out of time, but the joy of running an online webinar is that, and, and in COVID-19, we really have nowhere else to go. So if you have some time, please stay with us. Otherwise you can uh, uh, check out uh, the recording of this. We will send it to everyone, post this webinar. I think it would just be, be good to hear from one or two other participants and then have some closing remarks from our speakers. So if you do have to go, we understand. If you can stay with us, please do. Uh, George Harris, I see your hand is up. You're the, the headmaster, the 17th headmaster, headmaster of Hilton. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, what's any thoughts, reflections, or questions specifically that you want to ask? Thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, just so that people know, I've, I've had a experience in township schools and in looking after 40 schools in, in, in a township um, in what we know we call township areas in South Africa. So it's not just the high end um, sort of Hilton where I am at the moment. Um, but just some comments, I think to, um, to Rob and Sarah's point, just around there is no silver bullet in education. I think that's a real challenge that we face in that we, we don't have something that, that will just fix a, a fix all. But one of my observations over my career and especially working with department um, heads of schools is that there's a lack of agency and autonomy. Um, the, the, the 
provincial and national uh, structures have taken that away from principals by and large. And so we have a very d difficult situation where a good principal or someone who would make the right calls and who, who would do what is right for children is actually disempowered and unable to do that in the way that he or she would um, normally. And I think that's a travesty because, because I think we would, if, if we were able to create, uh, you know, my vision of schools in, in any community is that they should be the beacon of hope in a community. And um, if we drive past schools in our communities, they are seldom the beacon of hope. They're actually the, the rundown area that nobody really wants to go to. Um, and, and actually that's the converse of what they should be. So, um, and I think part of that is autonomy. And if we could cr change policy so that there is greater autonomy, um, for principles, um, you, I think you would then be able to adopt more um, contextually relevant approaches um, for, con for particular con um, contexts. So where there, there are opportunities for, for online learning um, in that context, a principal should be in a better position to be able to adopt that and make that work and create the blended environment. But so many of our, um, our schools are disenfranchised because of a, a, a sort of centralized approach. So that was the one thought I had. I think we've, the, those of us in privileged spaces, um, what COVID has taught us, we've been able to switch to an online version of school, but it isn't, um, in any way, a, and some teachers do it seamlessly and do it really well. Um, but to Sarah's point right at the beginning, you know, it, the content and the delivery is one thing. The challenge of connectivity and the challenge of, of the back end of the IT um, framework is really a totally different question. Um, we try to roll out in 40 schools a whole um, answer to this, and actually, the 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 struggle that we had almost um well basically we gave up after a while and it had nothing to do with the teachers and it had nothing to do with with a place it was really just the the backbone that wasn't um wasn't there in order for for the delivery to happen um the way that people wanted the, the delivery to happen and it just causes so much more frustration that people actually bail um and and i think what COVID has also taught us is the social um element of schooling is such a, um, an intangible piece that we can't underestimate. Young people, um, young people learn in the bumping of their peers um, in day-to-day -day living. Um, and the online platform, uh, as much as we wanted to do some of that, and I think in some cases it can, um, there, there's such a richness in a classroom that is difficult to replicate depending on your bandwidth um, to be able to really, really um, replace what we have in a classroom. So yeah, it's an interesting cool. discussion. So I hope thank I've you. Thanks George for your thoughts and reflections. Great. Appreciate that. I think, you know, before we just get closing, closing thoughts from the speakers, uh, I don't think we're gonna have time to unfortunately answer this, but I think the, um, one of our participants, um, we were Metawa um, said from a traditional and social context in black culture, there's a lot of skeptic skepticism, jeez, I cannot pronounce words today, around online process of education. Forgive me, please. There are questions around the quality of education and its effectiveness. My people are loyalty driven. And I was asked questions about Muzi being a fly by night in inverted commas institution because they did not trust anything that is not a VITS or UCT. Companies seem to also have the same skepticism around employee capabilities when employees have qualifications from rising online education platforms like Udemy. As Sarah said, that about 80% of the people in this country are black, and the most crippling thing might be that black youth may not be allowed to engage in such opportunities. In a post-COVID world, where we're being nudged towards where we're being nudged towards the 4IR, which means strengthened digital infrastructure and more contactless interactions, how might we eradicate this in inverted commas ignorance? Um, what a lovely statement and, and question of you. Um, guys, maybe you can, you can touch on it in your, in your closing remarks. Um, I think that would be, that'd be really helpful. Uh, Sarah, why don't we start with you in closing? If we can keep it to two to three minutes, that'd be great. 
we'll come to you, Rob, and then and then end off with Gil. Thanks, thanks, Viewer. Um, what you what you're getting at is, I think, the cultural alienation a lot of people experience from institutions that are what we call the symbolic capital of an institution that often what people value about education is much where you got it and how you got it as what you got and that is part of the way that education has been commodified um so when i was talking earlier about thinking about education as beyond just a commodity and about an emancipatory process we need to make people feel more ownership of their education um and to and to avoid the kind of stratification about what's considered quality and what's considered not and really, I, I just kind of want to end with the idea that online learning is, I, I mean, the question was panacea or a privilege. I'm afraid with the existing inequality we have, it remains a privilege. Um, we need to collectively be thinking together about what we want education to be for our society and why after so long, the vast majority of our children don't have access to that for want of the most ridiculously basic things. And what are we going to do about that? What are we all going to do about that? Because they're all our children, really. That I really feel that very strongly. Um, and so while these online conversations are important, I want to embed them in that broader social picture. And I think that's the frame that we need to be paying attention to if we really want to affect change and give onlining a shot at being something that children can be enhanced by rather than see as just a privilege for the rich. Awesome. Sarah, thank you so much for your thoughts and in this conversation. Rob, uh, let's go to you. Closing thoughts or remarks? Uh, sure thing. So I think just on, on a viewer's point, I, uh, Sarah touched on this, but I think that we at the moment as a culture and particularly in the world of employment have very unsophisticated signaling mechanisms that we use as signals for competence. A, a certificate from an institution that basically says I did these subjects, and I achieved these grade levels. It's like how on earth do we think that that maps to actual competence? I think that the, the true achievement of a lot of the top universities and institutions is actually in their admissions department. It's like, no matter what the quality of teaching and learning, if you get the highest caliber individuals with, that come from the strongest base, it's like, just put them in a room and, and magic's gonna happen. As opposed to like real accountability and focus on what is the actual learning gain that is taking place. And for me, that's a far more interesting question. And this is on an individual learner basis. On what basis do they come in with their various subjects, their various socio-emotional aspects, and what are we able to produce and what are we able to uh, create and, and facilitate as an experience for, for gain? And that, that for me is a really, really interesting question. I think that there's some encouraging movement there as it relates to, to um, recruitment and employers looking increasingly towards competency assessments, portfolios of evidence and so on, not necessarily viewing the certificates or the degree as the be all and end all. I think that that has to change. Like, the, the world of work needs it. The world of education needs it. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that this is a critical, critical move that will con continue, but it will take time. It takes time to change very deeply entrenched cultural norms. Um, and then I guess my closing thought is that I think that there are a plethora of challenges facing education. I think there need to, there need to be a wide array of solutions and a plethora of solutions. And for me, the real question is for us, anyone who cares about education, what's the What's the area that you can uniquely angle in on and, and lend a hand and start to shift towards a more, more positive educational landscape? And I think that, that the answer for me will be different from, uh, will be different from Sarah, will be different from, from Andrew and Gilbert. I mean, I think we've all got a role to play in this. Um, I, th I think that's pr probably enough said. Brilliant. Thanks, Rob. Um, Gil, uh, closing co comments or remarks from you, and if we can keep it to two to minutes, please, that'd be great. Sure. Yeah, thank you so much um, to, to everyone for joining us. I, I found this fascinating. Um, and just my closing reflection is one of our biggest lessons at Amuzi is, has been around questioning um, some of our assumptions around education being sort of like theoretical and book learning. And a lot of our intuitions lead us in that way. But I think so much more of it is around experience and practice. And, and we hear from the young people on our program, we, we hear from our employer partners that em, em, employ the young people, that they really value work experience. And that's what they're looking for. They're looking for evidence that someone has real experience. And, and I, I just want to commend, I think it's, it's fantastic to have people like Sarah working in this area because she's been a maths teacher. She, she's got that on the ground experience. She really understands what it's the challenges that, that she shared with us today about working in township schools and, and working in those challenging conditions and how many of those 
enabling conditions we are missing in our schools that, that allow for successful learning, whether it's in-person or, or, or online. Um, it's foundational stuff that's missing that, that we've underinvested in. Um, and I think that comes from that important lived experience. And it's just so fantastic to have someone who's a policy advisor and an academic who's grounded in that real experience. And I think similarly to, to Rob, I love the way that Rob shared with us the experiments that they're doing. They're experimenting with the Valencia Institute and they're experimenting with their blended learning model in low income communities on Mitchell's, in Mitchell's Plain with these uh, micro schools and classrooms and they're seeing what works and what doesn't work and what translates well and what doesn't translate. And it's through this experimentation. And that's, that's really something that I've learned to appreciate through Amuzi is that you really need to experiment. And I think that that's one thing that I hope to see a lot more of in our education system. You know, there's plenty of good criticism about uh, some of the charter school movement in the US, et cetera. Um, and there's a lot of good questions being asked about it. But what it has unlocked is this incredible level of experimentation. There's just so many different models that people are trying and they're competing with. And that's what you see in the online education space as well. It's a competitive market and there's a lot of different players that are, that are trying different things. Um, so I agree that education needs to be a public good. I agree with Sarah, but I think what we need more of is more experimentation and a wider variety of, of solutions so that, that we, because we're gonna need a wide variety of solutions because of how complex and, and difficult this problem is. Awesome, thank you, Gil. Um, and uh, on that note, maybe thank you so much for everyone joining us. I know we were a bit late, so please humble apologies to everyone out there. Um, I'm never good with time normally, and this is no different. Uh, what we will do is we will send around um, a recording of the session um, so that you can check out uh, anything that you've missed. And uh, we'll also send out some, some links to, to the speakers if you want to ask them some questions privately. Um, and hopefully, you know, I see some people saying in the chat that they'd like a part two of this. Hopefully we can organize that as well. Um, so yeah, from us, a very big thank you for everyone joining us again. And uh, if you missed some of the other sessions, please check them out as well. We'll send them on the email as well. And just please keep safe, please keep healthy, and please keep strong wherever you are. Thank you so much to our speakers and have a lovely Thursday. All the best. Ciao, ciao.